You are listening to Paz de Chipotle, special episode number two. Welcome to this special episode that will feature an interview with a leading expert on Mexico's cultural and historical drinking studies. We'll be exploring different aspects, past and present, of traditional alcoholic drinks in Mexico, which will cast light on little-known aspects of these traditions. Hello everyone, this is your host, Rocío Carvajal. Before we start, I want to tell you that I started Paz de Chipotle podcast with the mission of exploring the gastronomic heritage and traditions of Mexico by unveiling the stories and events that help shape Mexico's cuisine, which is such an important part of the nation's identity. And bringing new voices opens up the discussion and broadens the possibilities of having a true intercultural global exchange. Joining me was Dr. Deborah Tona, lecturer in modern American history at the University of Leicester. From her bachelor's degree to her postdoctoral studies, she's been focused on history, particularly in the social and cultural history of alcohol consumption in Mexico. She has written extensively on the topics of cultural history, identity, alcohol drinking, class, and nationhood. Amongst her numerous publications in academic journals, we can find Tequila, Distilling the Spirit of Mexico, published in the Journal of Latin American Studies, in 2016, Provincial Political Cultures and the Nation in 19th Century Mexican Fiction, published by the Journal of Iberian and Latin American Studies in 2014. Xochitl's Bar, Pulquerias, and Mexican Costumbrismo, published in Art and Architecture of the Americas in 2010. And her most recent book, Alcohol and Nationhood in 19th Century Mexico, which can be purchased on Amazon. The link will be available on this episode's post on Paz de Chipotle website. I want to thank again Dr. Turner for taking the time for being in this show. And without any more delay, here is the interview. Debbie, welcome to the show. It's such a pleasure to have you here and compress all the time zone between Mexico and England. Well, thank you so much for the, the invitation to be part of the podcast. Um, I've loved listening to the episodes so far and for the wonderful introduction as well. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. So there is so many things I would like to discuss with you regarding the cultural and historical aspects of the social role that beverages in Mexico uh, have had through the years. So I would like to divide this interview into sections. One, about pulque, and then we will move on to the 19th century uh, when the presence of breweries and distilled alcoholic drinks pretty much disrupted the pulque economy and drinking traditions in Mexico. Now, for those who are not familiar uh, with this drink, pulque is a pre-Columbian alcoholic beverage uh, made with the fermented sap of some varieties of agave from the central high plains of Mexico. And to this day, pulque is still produced and consumed in rural communities and cities like Puebla and Mexico City. So a bit of context for the listeners here. It turns out that Dr. Tono and myself uh, met and bonded over pulque back in 2015. And Deborah invited me to join on a collaborative research project called Consuming Authenticities, which eventually became the book Authentic Recipes from Around the World. And it was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and it was coordinated by uh, Dr. Tono herself. And this project was part of the program Care for the Future, Thinking Forward Through the Past. And it was primarily focused on exploring the concept of authentic foods and drinks as tangible and intangible cultural products through time 
and even space. So in a way, we will continue this conversation we started over two years ago. So now let me begin with this uh, opening question to jump right into the subject. What does the study of pulque reveal about pre-Columbian attitudes about alcohol consumption? And which role did this drink have in uh, the heavily controlled and religious society that uh, it was uh, back then in Mexico? Well, one of the most fascinating things for me about pulque is its incredibly long history. So archaeologists think that pulque has been made in central Mexico for at least 2,000 years. So it clearly had a, a very important place in pre-Columbian societies in Mexico. So the most famous of these um, were obviously the Aztecs, and we know quite a lot from their own writings about how pulque was used and the beliefs surrounding its use. And most importantly, pulque had very deep religious significance and, of course, many ritual uses that expressed those religious beliefs. Now, I think it's fair to say that, that pulque was one of several intoxicating substances. So together with things like chocolate and tobacco and so on, that was believed to bring about, um, when you consumed it, a state of instability and unpredictability, which was considered um, valuable. And it was considered valuable becoming intoxicated through pulque um, because it allowed people to communicate and even transfer qualities between human and divine states of being. Because pulque then had this sacred function that allowed humans and gods to, to talk to one another and to connect to one another, there were also very strict protocols about who could drink pulque, when, in what quantities, and for what purpose, and with severe punishments for, for people who violated those rules. Complicating that picture slightly, I think that scholars really debate how much those strict rules were enforced in practice, especially considering that um, Agua Miel, the sap from which pulque ferments naturally, was more freely available. Personally, I think pulque consumption was much more widespread than the strictness of those rules would have us believe. But I think the, the key point is the fact that these kinds of rules existed, even if they weren't enforced so widely, shows that pulque had a very high symbolic and cultural importance. So if pulque was able to open up these unstable channels through which humans and gods could interact with one another, it was important to try and control that force and then limit it to those people who were deemed powerful enough and prestigious enough to use it. That is really fascinating because most documented sources about the consumption of pulque and you're quite right, uh, together with other substances, definitely uh, have this very reinforced idea that it was absolutely controlled, so much so that it was strictly uh, reduced to just ceremonial occasions and not drink themselves to oblivion. Yes, ab absolutely. And I, I think and the, the historian out me, in me sorry, is coming out now in that the documents that we have that talk about this very rigid and strict control of pulque are very much written from, from a, a narrow perspective of the, the people who ruled Aztec society and their kind of ideal vision of how their society worked. So they're not necessarily all that great at allowing us an insight into the everyday lives of ordinary people within that world. And so we find this often um, in broader studies of the history of alcohol in Mexico, but also around the world, that um, the written documentation that we have about um, drinking culture often doesn't get to the heart of, of kind of everyday, ordinary consumption practices. So there, there is a fair amount of speculation that we have to engage in to try and, and get at that more daily kind of everyday significance of the drink. But what those documents certainly do tell us is that, that pulque was considered sacred and it, and it did have very important ceremonial and, and religious functions. <laughs> 
So uh, all these relationship with these drinks happened for over thousands of years. And then a very disrupted event happened in the history of Mexico, which was the Spanish conquest. After this came the establishment of the colony that lasted from 1521 to 1810. Now in your expert opinion, which were the main cultural aspects that occurred when Pulque transitioned in this new social condition and passed from being a religious drink to becoming secular and added to this came modern technology from Europe that enabled the production of distilled spirits such as tequila and mezcal. I think there's two main things I'd like to say about the the change that we see happening to pulque in the colonial period. Um, firstly, the most important change was the commercialization of pulque. So as we were just talking about, we're not sure how widely pulque was consumed in the, the pre-conquest times, but we do know that there were no commercial outlets for the sale of pulque during that period. And this is one of the things that changed very rapidly with the onset of Spanish colonization at the beginning of the 16th century. The first commercial licenses for selling pulque were granted to itinerant vendors in the 1530s in Mexico City. And by the 1650s, so 150 years later or so, there were more than 200 pulquerias or bars or taverns that sold pulque in Mexico City alone. So this was a, a, a really substantial change that made pulque widely available to people. Also, the production and trade of pulque in the colonial period brought um, very substantial revenue to the Spanish colonial government. And the consumption of pulque then became embedded in the daily diet, routine and popular culture of ordinary people in Mexico. So not just any longer indigenous Mexicans, but also um, the Spaniards living there, people of Spanish descent, and of course, mixed race people or mestizo people as well. Linked to this commercialization of pulque, the pulque business became really really a big business indeed. Um, by the 18th century, um, the agaves from which pulque is produced were grown on very large agricultural estates called haciendas. And by the end of the colonial period, so getting on for 1800, much of the pulque business was controlled by very, very wealthy aristocratic landowners. So on the one hand, Pulque took on a very important economic significance in the colonial period and became economically important. But the second observation I'd make is that at the same time, in social and cultural terms, the status of pulque actually went in the opposite direction across the colonial period because it went from being this sacred, um, religious, um, very high cultural value drink in the pre-conquest world to being denigrated or looked down upon as, as just the drink of the poor or the Indian drink. And so we see in the colonial period that Spanish elites and colonial authorities were very regularly concerned about pulque consumption leading to social disorder and um, immorality and unrest amongst the lower classes especially in the cities, but also more broadly in the countryside as well. So on the one hand, you have the, the economic status of pulque rising um, very rapidly and becoming a very significant thing. But on the other hand, in social and cultural terms, it actually becomes a low status um, drink. But as you know, the Spanish also brought with them the technology for distilling drinks because distilling drinks or producing distilled spirits within Mexico was actually illegal for much of the colonial period. We don't really know a lot about um, the production of mezcal and tequila in the colonial time period. Um, it was certainly going on, um, that, that much is definitely clear whether it was illegal or not, but the details are pretty few and far between. Um, some historians of tequila have shown that by the late 1700s, um, tequila production was widespread enough to be important to the regional economy around Guadalajara, um, where production of tequila is, of course, still concentrated. Um, but compared to pulque, those distilled products were still very much less common in the colonial period. Would it be fair to say that the transition of pulque into the colonial society was pretty much in an environment that had clearly double standards? 
one hand, the Spanish landowners benefiting greatly from this emerging economy, and on the other hand, stigmatizing those who were consuming these drinks they were producing, no? Yeah, that's it in a nutshell. One incident really highlights that very clearly in the 1692 riot in Mexico City, where a number of, of important buildings were, were burned down and, and there was fighting on the streets and various other things as well. And in the aftermath of this outburst of social unrest, Paul K was blamed for this situation and was even banned temporarily in the city. But because, as we've noted, the pulque business was very profitable for a certain sector of society, the ban didn't last very long and pulque was, was restored so that people could carry on making profit from it, but also that the government could continue collecting taxes from the trade. So. I think the, the, the people governing colonial Mexico were, were torn in these two directions. On the one hand, they, they viewed pulque very much with suspicion and pulque drinkers with suspicion. But as you say, they, they also profited from it quite significantly. So there was a good incentive not to actually install a, a full prohibition, really. No? Yes, exactly. And it's important to clarify, I think, as well, that the prohibition of producing things like mezcal and tequila wasn't due to a desire to prevent people from drinking those drinks so much as it was about protecting the trade in imported distilled drinks from Spain in order to protect the consumer markets for those goods amongst the more well-off in colonial Mexican society. Um, they didn't want any home produce, so to speak, to be produced and to compete with it. Um, so the prohibitions on, on those drinks was more about protecting Spanish trade than it was about preventing preventing people from consuming too much of them. So going forward in this cultural construct that it was a uh, pulqueria, so just like in Britain with the iconic and culturally significant pub has been the, the center of social life, at least in uh, some parts of urban and rural Britain, pulquerias here in Mexico were also very important places of socialization. And although some were inclusive spaces, in the sense that anyone who could uh, go and buy uh, pulque was welcomed. There was a huge class and racial aspect regarding who and how um, they were consuming pulque. So which other aspects could you share with the audience about how c class and race shaped alcohol drinking in Mexico from the half point of colonial period to fast forward to the 19th century? Gosh, there's such a huge amount I could say about this subject. It's clear that through the colonial period, pulque acquired this reputation of being the Indian drink or the drink of the poor. So although they might not have liked to admit it, um, people from all walks of life did drink pulque. And you mentioned pulquerias. So I think I'm going to concentrate on the history of pulquerias, the places where pulque was sold and consumed. I mean, the first observation to make is that the number of pulquerias in Mexico City expanded massively. By the end of the 19th century, there were over a thousand pulquerias in Mexico City alone. This really reiterates the point that you made, how important these places became to urban social life and, and socialising. But where they were located in Mexico City tells us some really interesting things about class and, and racial divides. From about the middle of the 19th century onwards, several waves of, of legislation and regulations started to exclude pulquerias from certain parts of Mexico City. And these were places mostly where either well-to-do or wealthy people lived, or that attracted um, the most important kind of foreign dignitaries and, and visitors. Uh, so effectively, it, to sum that process up, um, poor careers were more and more concentrated in the poorer neighbourhoods um, and places where mostly indigenous people lived. The pulquerias that did remain in what I'll just call the posher parts of the city were by the, the end of the 19th century forced to make changes that would reduce their visual impact. So hiding their interiors from view with shutters, for instance. Authorities didn't stop thinking that bad things were going on in pulquerias. 
but they became more concerned about wealthier upper class Mexicans and visitors to the city having to see the popular classes drinking and what they were getting up to. They thought this kind of created a bad image um, of Mexico that was unmodern and they wanted to hide it from view. Right, so it was pretty much, a, could we say, an early attempt to do uh, some gentrification, a sort of social cleanse uh, in the historical center of the FA? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a really good way to describe it. You know, when you consider that the number of pulquerias actually explodes in this time period, so there's more and more of them and they're more and more important to people's daily lives, but only for certain parts of the of the population. And so you see... I think segregation is too strong a word, but um, yeah, a kind of marking out of different spaces within the city that are supposed to be for um, the more upper class, wealthier, gentrified parts of the Mexican population and then everybody else and the rest, basically. Something else that happens alongside that is there's quite a lot of writing about alcoholism as a condition in Mexico in the late 19th and early 20th century. And unusually, um, at least in comparison to the way alcoholism is written about elsewhere in Europe, in North America, for instance, um, a lot of attention in Me Mexico was focused on pulque as a particular um, problem in producing alcoholism. Quite a large number of, of medical and, and political commentators on alcoholism thought that, that pulque was as dangerous as absinthe, for instance. You know, when you consider that pulque has the same more or less alcoholic strength as, as beer, those views are quite obviously connected more to fears about the type of people who were drinking pulque rather than pulque itself as, as a drink. Beyond that, I would say actually more down to prejudice about indigenous mixed race and lower class people within Mexico who were seen to suffer from drinking problems more than than other um, social classes. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, ironically enough, Fulke has been um, successfully proven to have benefits for the health, well, co when consumed um, not in excess, obviously. Yes, absolutely. It has, um, in comparison to um, most alcoholic drinks, and including things like beer and cider, it's got really high vitamin content and proteins as well. Um, and in fact, there, there were still very prominent defenders of pulque, even at this moment in history. Um, so there is a study in, I think, the 1890s by a doctor who worked at a Mexican prison who actually used pulque to successfully treat a scurvy outbreak. Um, amongst the inmates. Um, so so people were aware of these things, but um, to my mind, that makes it all the more strange um, and in need of explanation as to why um, so many people at this time thought erroneously, I would add, that, that pulque was more dangerous than um, distilled spirits. Um, and I think the explanation for that lies in um, essentially a, a class-based and race-based prejudice against against pulque. Well, also Mexico was having a more civilized view of itself and cities were being modernized. Between the 1860s and the first half of the 1900s occurred many events that disrupted everything again. So uh, the consequences of the War of Independence back in 1810 were still present so the society was still sort of stitching up itself together. Then came the reform war that separated uh, state and church, which wasn't a minor event in the history of Mexico. And then uh, added to this internal turmoil, uh, Mexico also suffered attempts to uh, being invaded by France and the United States. And added to this, <laughs> uh, the revolution occurred in 1910. So it was a very prolonged and very difficult uh, period with very volatile conditions and uncertainty in which this new Mexican identity uh, was being forged. And luckily for us, we have a very robust set of literary works, novels mainly, that portrayed everyday life in Mexico during all this period. They help us see this construction of a notion of uh, national identity and what it meant to be Mexican. In your recent book, uh, Alcohol and Nationhood in the 19th Century in Mexico, 
you make a very compelling and fascinating analysis uh, uh, precisely of this period using the references from the novels by Manuel Paino and by Ignacio Manuel Altamirano. Both authors uh, masterfully captured the zeitgeist of the time. So I'm interested in, uh, in digging deeper into the ways these works helped shape the imaginary about nationhood and how, obviously, alcohol became an unforeseen thread playing a key role in all these phenomena. Yes, and the book of mine that you mentioned really concentrates on before the 1910 period. So in looking to the, the 19th century and including some of the novelists that you've mentioned, like Manuel Paino, probably one of the most important authors of that period, pulquerias and pulque drinking actually appeared in, in a much more positive light as quintessentially uniquely Mexican. Um, and Manuel Paino's novels are a great example. Uh, and he often depicts Mexican traditions in a much more positive light than government policy was treating traditional aspects of Mexican culture like pulque drinking, for instance. Paino describes this pulqueria in a neighborhood in Mexico City. Um, he describes in quite a lot of detail the vibrant murals on the walls of the pulqueria, one of which is um, a figure known as Xochitl, who was involved in the origin story or the legendary discovery of Pulque. So it was a way of drawing out the very long-standing and deep-rooted history that was built into Mexican nationhood or national identity. And and that's one of the consistent threads that runs throughout um, Pino's novel. Now, I, I've said that you start to see quite a, a significant shift then in the aftermath of the revolution. And that's partly because kind of leaders of Mexican government and politics before the revolution, their vision of creating a modern Mexico was about emulating Europe or emulating the United States, for instance, whereas the new leaders after the revolution more explicitly celebrated Mexico's identity as a mestizo nation, so a, a mixed nation that came about with the intermixture of indigenous and Spanish cultures. And of course, food and indeed drink was one of the key things that could symbolise that process of cultural fusion between um, Indigenous and Spanish. So with it coming from an Indigenous plant, but needing the Spanish technology of distillation to be produced, tequila was seen as the, the kind of emblem of that mestizo or mixed cultural process in a way that pulque wasn't because it, it had such strong roots to the, the pre-conquest past. Now, exactly when that symbolic image of tequila as the national drink instead of pulque really became embedded, I think is a more open-ended question. Uh, Marisa Rita Gaitan, who wrote a wonderful book called Tequila, Distilling the Spirit of Mexico, she dates that transition period in the post-revolutionary moment, the, the 1940s in particular, with the golden age of Mexican cinema, popularizing the kind of revolutionary Mexican soldiers drinking tequila and being all kind of macho and swaggery and stuff. Tequila especially is, you know, pretty much exclusively associated with Western Mexico, the state of Jalisco in particular. And a lot of these iconic images that were formed in the Mexican cinema of that sort of 1940s, 1950s period were set in the rural countryside, the great country estates of Jalisco. And so it's that image of Mexico, I think, that became more important comparatively um, in imagining the national identity than Mexico City. Big tequila producers had been um, held up since the late 19th century, actually, as examples of um, forward-looking industry. Um, so I think Tequila Sousa, for instance, um, won a bunch of medals at an international expo exposition in the 1890s. And this was a source of pride um, for the national government, you know, in a way that pulque never ever was a source of pride for, for government policymakers. And then another um, kind of aspect to, to this equation is, is beer, actually. Um, from about the 1930s and 40s, so at the same time that tequila was kind of coming, becoming a national symbol, um, the 
the government worked with the beer industry to promote itself as a healthier alternative, a more modern alternative, a more hygienic alternative to pulque. So while the exact relationship between that process and the emergence of tequila as a national symbol is maybe a little bit messy and unclear, what it did help to do was further tarnish Pulke's reputation. So maybe that opened up a space or a bigger space um, for tequila then to, to become more embedded in the popular imagination as the symbol of Mexico. And actually you touched a very important point, but I uh, want to leave it just there because that really deserves another special interview, please, uh, which is the brewing industry in Mexico that displaced a lot of drinks and even competed heavily with tequila and mezcal. But because we are now reaching the end of this session, uh, I would really like to have your opinion about the social impact that these kind of studies have. So in your experience and of course uh, in your particular take on food, drinks and culture, what do you think are the most significant impacts that social and uh, cultural and of course historical studies have regarding intangible heritage and why they are relevant today, why we need to study these areas, why we need to buy products like you know, like your your books and all the research that you and your team are producing, how they improve our lives, how knowing all these uh, make our lives better. Well, that's a brilliant question um, on which to conclude and I'll say I'll be very happy to come back to another um, interview about beer. But I think the, the main reason I'm so fascinated with the history of food and drink and, and the cultural um, lives that they have have is that you know eating and drinking and telling stories about food have such a great capacity to allow us to think about diversity and commonality across cultures so the food stories that are told around um, eating and drinking experiences, where particular products come from, their histories and how they've been embedded in particular cultures over time. These are really important for being able to translate the, the broader histories and cultures of different parts of the world to one another. So there's such very human things and experiences. So even if a particular food or a particular drink is completely unknown to you, you know nothing about it, or maybe you do and you find it disgusting, I think there's still that potential to be able to establish a connection and an, and an understanding through other humans, other people. I mean, when I first time I went to Mexico it was about 10 years ago, I only knew about Mexican food through reading about it. And the only Mexican food I'd experienced was the extremely poor imitation of it that you could then get in the UK. Things are much better now, I hasten to add. But back then, really, you know, all the El Paso kind of fajita kits was about the extent of it. So actually being able to see and, of course, eat the amazing variety um, and richness of food in Mexico was just such a mind boggling experience for me and really brought the historical interest that I had to life and so I really hope that other people through reading kind of historical and cultural studies accounts of different foods and drinks from around the world that people can have that same experience that the very stories that are embedded in in human experience the world over can be brought to life through that experience and of course then the other thing that's kind of connected to that is that you know the movement of people and their food is, is so thoroughly entwined, both historically, but also in our present day, um, you know, with migration around the world and looking at how cuisines adapt and change as they move around the world with the people who love them really tells us a huge amount about the process of cultural change, how it happens and, and why it's meaningful. So I would really encourage people to take every opportunity to read about the, the history of food or the history of drink in a different part of the world that they know nothing about. It's an excellent way to build bridges and build relationships with people from across the world. But yes, yes, I couldn't agree more. Like I was, I was nodding <laughs> at your every word. <laughs> I was like, yes, yes, yes. Uh, absolutely. I mean, um, 
that that's pretty much the the reason behind this podcast and behind my gastronomy project is to communicate the the human aspect that binds us together because at the end of the day we all get hungry right so and we we all share food stories and we all grow up uh, being shaped by what we eat who feeds us what do they feed us and then eventually uh, what we choose to feed our children with and it goes way beyond the fuel because we're feeding our present and future generations even with culture indeed no absolutely you couldn't have put it any better <laughs> well so i want to thank you for your time and uh, for sharing with this beautiful global audience of pasta chipotle and i'm sure by this moment uh, many listeners are absolutely going bonkers trying to find your work <laughs> on the internet so please tell the audience how can they Uh, find more information about your work, your publications, and of course something we haven't mentioned, but you will now, the Drinking Studies Network. Yeah, thank well, thank you for 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 the opportunity to plug myself in in every way, shape, and form. Um, people can contact me on Twitter. Um, my handle's at Deborah Toner. People can are free to email me. My email address is dt151 at le.ac.uk that's probably quite difficult to to capture uh, in spoken format so if you simply google deborah toner and lester um it will come up you've just mentioned the the drinking studies network that i run this is for anybody who's interested in drink and drinking culture across the world we are mainly um scholars who take part in that network but we do have a, a good number of members from the non-academic world so people who are uh, you know beer bloggers or people from within the alcohol industry um, for instance so everybody's welcome and it's free to join we operate as a hub for all sorts of exciting information and events we've actually got one of our own conferences coming up in february 2018 um on the theme of changing drinking cultures and the the network has a website drinkingstudies.wordpress.com again if you google drinking studies network it should pop up as the first result in google and then finally we mentioned very briefly at the outset um the consuming authenticities project that we work together on and we do still the, the recipe book that we produce from that called authentic recipes from around the world i do still have a number of copies of that book which are are free to any interested parties so if anybody would like a free copy of that book there are chapters on pulque of course um, but also on a carage an important street food from Brazil welsh cider and um flaunes which are um, celebration easter pies from cyprus So if that sounds intriguing and I'm sure it does to the audience of this podcast um just get in touch with me um with an address and I'll mail you a free copy That is very generous of you of course. Obviously we have some uh geographical constraints. So for people outside Britain who want to have a copy of this book, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's available online in some of the platforms of the different uh universities that took part in this project, is that right? Yes, um there's a kind of unbound version if you like, so it doesn't have the cover and and stuff like that, but the main text from the book is available to download from my pro file and the other authors profiles on academia.edu but I am more than happy to post the books internationally um University of Leicester my employer will pick up the bill for that wow <laughs> um, so yeah I could I can I'm happy to post actual copies of the book internationally as well so so do please feel free to get in touch with me for a copy I mean honestly audience you couldn't ask for a more generous guest here in the show So please anyone who's interested in uh, any of these projects you can uh, go to these episodes uh, blog post that is going to be available on pazachipotle.com all the accounts and uh, websites and everything will be available there including a link to uh, purchase your own copy of Alcohol and Nationhood in 19th Century in Mexico which is available on Amazon you can google it yourself but of course I'll make it easy for you and I will have a nice link on my website You can buy it physical or digital to take it with you and read it calmly and obviously we'll follow the Drinking Studies Network and Dr. Turner at, at Deborah Turner on Twitter. Debbie, thank you so much again. It's been such a real treat having you here. 
and I'm very much looking forward to seeing you again. We have so much to, to, to cook and to talk and to drink. <laughs> <laughs> it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, audience, please stay tuned and we'll be back shortly after this break. Thank you for listening to this second special episode of Pase Chipotle, this time with the presence of Dr. Deborah Turner, lecturer in modern American history at the University of Leicester, an undisputed authority on alcohol studies and Polka's cultural history in Mexico. We'll return in a couple of weeks with episode number eight, and you better get your bowls and big spoons ready, because we're getting some pozole soup. We'll explore the weird and surprising superstitions in traditional cooking, and get funky with the mystical uses of toxic plants in ancient Mexican healing rituals. I really want to thank you for the amazing feedback. I'm so happy this show and Sabor, this is Mexican Food Magazine, have indeed become a companion to open the door to the generous world that is Mexican gastronomy. It's really motivating to hear it's helping you be better teachers of Spanish language and culture, help Mexican experts share their culture with their families and motivate food entrepreneurs to find inspiration in Mexican food to set up their own businesses. This is indeed the impact that matters, the one that makes a difference and enriches lives. Remember, you can contact me via email, Instagram or Twitter. Links and contact details are on the show's description. Support the show on Patreon, the largest platform that connects creators with bright audiences like you. To find more information about the show and Sabor, this is Mexican Food Magazine and the latest summer issue dedicated to exploring Coco, Mexico's greatest gift to the world, please go to pasdechipotle.com forward slash magazine. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you very much for tuning in. Subscribe, rate and share the show. Goodbye from me, or as we say in Mexico, hasta la próxima, amigos.